So, um, I said I was going to do a lesson on ambient occlusion, and uh, here we go. So first of all, let's define what ambient occlusion is. I'll just write it as AO for short. Right? A stands for ambient, O stands for occlusion. The reason it's called ambient occlusion is because in real-time rendering, you usually want to do lighting in two different components. You know, let's say here's our scene, right? There's a sphere, this is a direct light. The first component is just a direct lighting, okay? It's a lighting that will hit head-on by the primary light source. There's also the second component, which is the indirect lighting, which, you know, comes from the sky light. The, you know, on Earth, it will be the atmosphere light that's reflected to back to the surface. Or it's the primary light hitting some surface then rescatter throughout space into other points which you know, adds light to the scene. So generally um, these two things are done separately for since we're only doing our approximations. Uh, the actual computation of this process is too expensive to do in real time usually, even though that's about to change I believe with the current uh, new hardwares. Um, Say you want to do path tracing, then it will be just lighting in one term. You're, just, you're literally simulating the the path of the light being traced. You know, we will do that sometime later, or sometimes later, but not currently. Right now, we're focusing on real time rendering. So we already covered direct lighting, right? It's the Lambert law. It's the simple reflection model we made. Some form of that, some form of direct lighting. We have not touched indirect lighting at all. The crucial behavior of indirect lighting is that if the point you're shading is in some kind of corner or being occluded by some geometry, say, you know, this is a sphere, this is the uh, plane, and you're shading this point, you can see the hemisphere around this point. A large portion of it is occluded. Therefore, the skylight is shooting this way, right, in this portion, will get blocked by the geometry that's blocking this point. And the indirect lighting will eventually, there will be less indirect lighting hitting this point because there's less ample space for the light to bounce around. In contrast, if the surface has no occluders and it's perfectly flat, then you can expect the skylight to fully hit it and the um, direct lighting to hit it as well. And indirect lighting has another term you can describe it as. It's used to be called the ambient light, ambient lighting. Even though that's kind of disappearing because uh, the industry is shifting away to physically based rendering and ambient lighting implies that you just multiply it by some, add it by some constant to approximate the lighting. Um, it, it still makes, the, the words itself it still makes good sense because ambient is kind of light that exists everywhere. And that is usually true because sky is literally covering all the scene and the global illumination, which is indirect lighting that's bouncing around usually, you know, really gets to every single point in the surface, even though some of the, the points in the surface gets less of that if you do to increase in this geometry occlusion. So ambient, ambient occlusion, it's approximation of how intense your ambient lighting is at a certain point, right, which is determined by its geometric characteristics. So I believe the person who came up with these, uh, I'm the, the, the ambient occlusion technique that I'm going to introduce is not going to be screen space because it's way better than screen space. I, I thought about it like I was going to give you a screen space method, but then if we ha already have such a superior method, then why are we still using screen space? It doesn't really make sense. So here's what we're going to do, right? So say we're on a, just a single plane, right? We want to approximate, you know, around the hemisphere, how much of the indirect light does it get? So this is a method of getting that. This is our point being shaded, and these are the five test points that we laid out. Let's name them A, B, C, D, E, okay? So one interesting thing about it is that since we're using the sine distance function, um, because this thing is flat, we can put each of these points back to the sine distance function term. So pi, it, and the value is spit out. We expect it to be the distance from the point to the, I mean, from the test point to the shade, shading point, right? So 
but we expect them to be exactly equal. All right. However, this expectation is not always, not always going to be true if there is some kind of occlude or say a sphere next to this point. And some of the point when you put SDF in back into it, the distance it returns will be smaller than the distance it is away from the shaded point. Meaning there's extra geometry blocking, you know, this point kind of in its proximity. Therefore, you know that it's being included by something. So if you do a hemisphere integration, you can get some, you can sort of expect some value that's less than one, say. So we already defined, we already defined the AO, ambient occlusion term, when it's equal to zero, it means no ambient light, because it gets blocked. And if it's one, then it means full ambient light, right? How do we formally uh, formulate this test, though? We know we can use the distance, the sine distance function with the input as these points as some, some sort of clue to how occluded our geometry is, right? All we can do is to sum these points up. We kind of do a subtraction of the original distance from the um, the closest distance from this point. If everything is fine, then you know we expect them to be exactly the same. That the subtraction will result result in a zero. That means everything is fine. This point is not included at all. If the subtraction results in some kind of you know positive positive value, then that means no good. Some geometry is getting closer to the point point being tested than the shading point. Then we know there's some kind of occluder. By adding all these points up, we know like how much of this portion is you know, included. This is nowhere near physically correct, but it's a very good approximation nonetheless. So to formally write it out, the AO, given a point and a normal, actually. So point and a normal, we can do N test points, doesn't matter what, right? And we have some kind of epsilon value, so it's a really, really small value. Say it's around um, 0 0.1, 0 .1, let's say. And each time we're going to apply the sine distance function. Actually, no. We're going to com first compute the distance the current test point is away. So these we have a bunch of little samples to do ambient occlusion test. So each of these samples, how far is the sample away from being the point being shaded? Now remember, we're stretching it out vertically outwards into a space, so it's very easy to compute a distance. It's very easy. It would just be epsilon, it's the distance each point that's you know made between times i. That's it, right? We look at the test points. So these are the samples. So this is a sample number one, two, three. It's just epsilon, epsilon, epsilon. Right. So if we go out from number three, then it's going to be three epsilons away from the point being tested, which is p. This point subtract the SDF of the current point plus the displacement we apply to it. So it's going to be the magnitude epsilon times t multiply with n. The normal of the point, right? Okay, so we really want to capitalize normal. We don't have like naming confusions here. Okay. A fancy end here. So this term, this is gonna um, this this is going to return this expression is gonna return zero if there's no occlusion, it returns positive number if there is an occlusion. So what we can do is uh, subtract this term from one, so one represents full ambient light, and you know, the other, the other way around represents no light at all. That we want to average this result. So one over n applied to whatever the summation goes into is the approximation of you know what we have. There's a better way to approximate that. I will just show you what this looks like and tell you the improvement you could possibly make on it, which is um, right now we're taking these test points equally as equally important 
but really if it's further away then we really expect the point to be closer to occlude something right so if both one if one is occluded then we know big trouble some occluder is really close therefore the chance of the hemisphere being covered entirely is super high but if five is covered instead of one then we know that it's kind of reasonable because we're already really far out into the space right so the integration could still um result in some high values so there's really it's unreasonable to treat point the test result from point five and point one to be equally uh, valuable to be equally important so we can see how we can um, uh, do do some trick on that so i copied the soft shadow code into the shaded line so let me change uh change the wording a little bit so this is going to be direct light okay and there's going to be a new term indirect light I don't know how much indirect lighting I have. I'm just going to put an approximation to it. It's going to be albedo multiplied by direct light and indirect light. Now we have two terms. It's going to look a little weird, right? You can see the dark part is no longer completely dark, even though it's still uniform in a sense. And the crease around it, you can't really see. You know, you don't have a sense of 3D because the, the rendering is incorrect because you know all the points in the shadow space gets in equal amount of indirect lighting which is not natural so instead what we're going to do is put indirect lighting multiplied by the ao term that gets point p and the normal as the input okay so ambient occlusion term let's go in back three point and in back three normal right so if we stubbing 0 0.1, not, nothing's going to change. If we're stubbing 0, everything's going to be dark again. All right. Okay, so given what we said, we're going to set some kind of epsilon, right? Epsilon. Or I can just simply put E as a very small value, right? And maybe in term we have some kind of result because we're going to add to this term a lot. And let's see. So we're going to do a for loop for the summation. For, and say, I want to run this five times. Okay. Let's start with one. I really want an equal sign here. Where it's plus equals minus epsilon times i float minus the SDF of t plus oh, put this t as distance estimation then this is going to be how far away it is so we don't have normal and lowercase sdf requires a material index i think sdf so i'll just put ignored Ignore here, and then I'm going to divide result by you know, however many test cases we have. Well, my WebGL implementation does not. If I put some kind of variable in here, it doesn't doesn't like it. So I'm just going to hard code a 5.0 here and put result in. Nothing's going to happen. Well, that is fun. A O. I'm being applied here. Two, zero point one. Okay. So apparently it's always going to be above once SDF T plus D D minus. We've got to be doing something wrong here. What is it? Um, so let's do a bit of sanity check. Minus distance ignored. Send this is function if this is as big as d, it's always going to be zero. So basically, the fact that there's nothing changing in our, in our scene is telling us that this term always evalu evaluates to zero, which is kind of interesting. So if we put two here, 
Okay. Um, I'm not sure what's this case. There you go. My E was too small. So if you have a really small E, then it's always going to be true because occluders generally are still pretty far away. 0 0.01 is way too small. So if we lower the, you know, the just how far the um, approximation in hemisphere is, the farther it is, the darker the edges because it's taking more, taking into account more, um, more lighting. I mean, more geometry that surrounds us at this point. Okay, so you can see this is a more pleasing, pleasant effect. Kind of like it. Mm. So I think maybe I'm putting this a little bit too much. Uh, okay, fine. I'll just put it at 0 0.1. Whatever. Another thing I want to mention is this is not the best looking ambient occlusion that, that you can get. Actually, you can do something way better than this. Let me just kind of, um, okay, so I lift the sphere up. I'll talk about how you can lift it up, but for now, just, <laughs> you, got, you can do just, just, just this transformation on the point to lift everything up. I'll tell you how that works. So you can kind of see the ambient, ambient occlusion turn really doesn't differentiate itself until it gets really you know far away. Actually, I'll show you. Like the, There's going to be some banning artifact. So this is how we, this is how you generally debug in graphics. You just write color out to the screen, right? So AO term. So you can see the ambient occlusion is kind of too dark on this side, for my liking at least. It's a bit you know it's a bit too concentrated, you know. So one thing you could do is now remember if we factor one over n into the, these terms. Let me use mouse. Jesus. So if we factor and you know, we apply 1 over n back into each term, then that means each term will be uh, averaged. Each term will have the importance value of 1 over n that gets added up. right? So each term has the same weight. But, but, but you have to realize that as long as all our coefficients, if we sum them up, as long as this result of the summation is equal to 1, it's a valid coefficient to use in this case, just so we can ensure that the value will not go over, go over that 1. So a way better uh, a way better summation series to use here is, you know, I think it's called the arithmetic series. I'm not sure. But I can tell you that Infinitely, if we go on, go on infinitely, then this is going to be some sum to one. Okay. So this is quite an ideal mo uh, model of you know coefficients to replace that because both is sums to one, and as the term goes farther and farther away, they have less weight on them. Right. So you can see it retains well. If we just sum up the first five terms, it's going to be approximately one. It's not going to be a really good one, but that little error could be ignored. So this is how we do it. So we just do, instead we just do 1 over 2 i, which is the iteration term, right? So instead of subtracting by 5, let me just put a define here because I'm tired of matching numbers. So define AO iteration count to 5. And the entire, entire expression here gets 1 over float AO inter. This is when if we you know, apply the constant term on the outside back into each term, nothing is going to change. Um, did I... Yeah, it's the exact same stuff. Okay. So instead, what, what instead we're going to do is have some kind of weight value, which, and we initialize the weight to 0 0.5. And each, each time we're going to 
multiply by 0 0.5 that way, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're you know, because the 1 over, one over 2 multiplied by 0 0.5 equals, and it goes to 1 over 4, and so on. This is how we can simulate the series. And as you can see, the first sample is going to be to take, you know, at least half of the weight. The next sample is one fourth, the next sample is one, one eighth, which is what we want because you know, the point that's being tested closer holds much more weight than some point we're testing out in the space. So now the Embley inclusion term still is just an approximation, but it looks much more pl uh, pleasant. pleasant. All right. So let's turn on our color. You can see that it's less dark on the edge, it's kind of gradually going out to be, you know, full ambient light, which is really pleasant. So if we do a uh, two or three, and let me put the sphere back. That was just for testing demonstrations, it's not supposed to go up that out far. So, okay, so back to, our, to the same geometry that we had. Now we can see some ambient occlusion on the side, which is really nice, right? Kind of, uh, you can kind of expect the same thing from a fully physical, physically based renderer. Approximation for indirect lighting. So now we have officially taken indirect lighting into our shading process, which is really cool, I think. Well, it brings more realis realism to the scene. So that's it. That's the topic for today, which is ambient occlusion. All right. We'll see you next time.